Marx was interested in interrogating the notion of exchange value to get to the heart of what it was really all about. It led him to a concept of intrinsic value given to commodities by labor. We've already followed this argument in video 4. Here, I will review the argument in order to demonstrate how it functions as an interrogation into the one-sidedness of the concept of exchange value. Exchange value is an observable phenomena in our world. Commodities exchange in certain ratios. A commodity's exchange value is the ratio at which it exchanges with another commodity. At first glance, exchange value can seem random and accidental. But we observe that in reality, exchanges are not accidental and random. Stocks of commodities are replenished, creating a regularity to exchange ratios. What could this process be that takes away the accidental nature of exchange and replaces it with a social regularity? When I say one book equals 30 pencils, I am comparing magnitudes. But magnitudes of what? To compare magnitudes, you have to have some substance or essence that you are comparing. This leads Marx to conclude that commodities have an intrinsic value. All of these different exchange values are just different ways of expressing this intrinsic value. But we never see the intrinsic value. We only see the various commodities that are used to measure its magnitude. We are still in the world of exchange. All we have done is to analyze the nature of exchange value, which leads to this idea of intrinsic value. But here is where we have to leave the world of exchange in order to ground our concept further. Intrinsic value is a pivot concept that forces us to move to the world of production. What is the substance that intrinsic value is made up of? It can't be the use value of commodities because use values can't be quantitatively related. You can't compare the use of an apple to the use of a car quantitatively. The only logical place to look is the labor process, the process whereby individuals create the world in which they live. This answer to the question of intrinsic value was not accepted by all of Marx's critics. Some argued that there are many other things that can make up this intrinsic value, like scarcity or utility. Yet, as we've already seen, scarcity and utility are incomplete, one-sided concepts that can't be understood unless they are grounded in a theory of production. Only through an understanding of the activity of people as they shape their world and the way in which the particular mode of that production shapes the individual can we understand scarcity and utility. This makes labor the obvious focal point for our investigation into the value relations that make up a capitalist society. Labor is the way we create the objective world we encounter, and the way we create ourselves. It makes sense that this notion of value might not be intuitive for some to accept. In a capitalist society, we are separated from our labor. Our working power is a commodity that we sell to a capitalist. The capitalist owns our labor and the product of that labor. We don't have a sense of our labor as a purposeful activity or a social activity. Our labor must take the form of a commodity with a market value before it becomes social labor. Value obscures the social nature of our labor. As you may know, Marx's bourgeois predecessors, Adam Smith and David Ricardo, amongst others, subscribe to a labor theory of value. You might think, then, that this means that they too had a proper dialectical understanding of the relation between production and exchange. But this is not the case. Marx reproaches both Smith and Ricardo for reducing form to content. The distinction turns out to be crucial. The content of value is labor. By this we mean that the social substance that makes up value is labor. But we don't see this content when we examine a commodity. No matter how we may poke, prod, smell it, or take it apart, we can't see its social content. That's because this content takes a material form. This form is exchange value. When we say it takes a material form, we mean this literally. The value of the book takes on the form of pencils, or tires, or baritones. So Marx makes a distinction between the content of value, labor, and the form of value, which is exchange value. This means that value and exchange value are different. And since price is just a special form of exchange value, price and value are different. 
Prices are just the surface appearance of value, but this value has no fixed physical form independent of its material expression in pencils, tires, or money. We only see the form of value, not the content. For Smith and Ricardo, price is immediately identifiable with value. This is what Marx means when he says they reduced form to content. They treated the content of value, labor, as if it immediately had an exchange value. They failed to understand that value is a process whereby labor takes on the material form of exchange value. But these exchange ratios are not value. They are merely the expression of this third thing, called intrinsic value. This allows Marx to examine the ways in which prices fluctuate around values which allows him to solve some theoretical problems that eluded his predecessors. It also leads him to ask an important question that Smith and Ricardo had never asked. What type of labor produces value? Because Smith and Ricardo saw labor and price as identical, they assumed all labor, in all times, created value. As we know, these sort of appeals to universality and eternal concepts are problematic. It is only a specific type of labor that produces value, labor for exchange. And thus, only a specific type of society in which there is a regular, predictable, disciplining of labor to the needs of market exchange can be a society ruled by the law of value. In case it's not obvious, there's a central ideological issue at stake in this distinction between the general and the particular. It's quite simple. Things that are universal can't be changed. There's no use organizing, studying, reading, or complaining about them. If human beings are always a certain way, then that's just how it is. But if we want to change the world, we need to know what aspects of our reality are not universal. What things are merely the product of the organization of our social relations? What things might change under a different type of organization? In a capitalist society, much of the world of appearances comes from our experience in the market, in the realm of exchange. But from this one-sided perspective, we aren't able to see the historic specificity of these market experiences. Without a perspective of the type of productive relations that underlie the freedom, equality, and individuality of the market, we end up making universalizing and inadequate generalizations about human nature. Such a one-sided perspective makes it seem as if we are trapped in the present, as if the problems of today are universal problems of all time, unable to be transcended.